Good morning, happy Sabbath. Thank you so much for that beautiful song. It reminds us of the things we need to be thankful for, and one of that is family. What do we do without family? <clears throat> Definitely we need to focus on our families, maintain that relationship, and be thankful for the gift of family. Today, it's the Thanksgiving weekend, and there's lots of things to be thankful for, lots of things that we can thank God throughout this week that He has done for us, and a lot more of the things that we can do to be thankful for, because God is good. Now, for today, we're going to be going through the last of the Ten Commandments. Hopefully, uh, on the screen, it's going to show up. Let me... Uh Thank you, thank you. Just to get out of the way. So the 10th commandment, you might wonder, well, why should we preach the 10th commandment on a Thanksgiving weekend? Well, you're going to find out. <laughs> why we can preach the 10th commandment on a Thanksgiving weekend. The Bible tells us that this is the last of the Ten Commandments. So we have reached the end of the series of our Ten Commandments. But there will be one more after this. Not one more commandment, but another sermon to conclude the series in the Ten Commandments. But the Tenth Commandment is uh, given to us for a specific reason. In Exodus 20, verse 17, it says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not call your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Sometimes when we look at this commandment, we say, ah, this is easy. This isn't hard to do. And sometimes we deal with this commandment in a light manner, as if not being that important. The Hebrew word for covetousness here, or covet, as the commandment is pointing out, is also the word desire. Desiring something is not necessarily bad. For example, desiring to be like Jesus is something good. But desiring to be Jesus is something bad, just like Lucifer desired in heaven. To be like Jesus or to be Jesus? Therefore, coveting is desiring what your neighbor has and being envious that he has it and not you. Actually, covetousness and envy are related in a sense because covetousness is desiring the possessions that your neighbor has while envy is anger that your neighbor has it and not you. Envy pushed Cain to kill his own neighbor, that is, his own brother. Covetousness pushed Achan to take the forbidden articles from Jericho for himself, resulting in the deaths of so many of the Israelites. Envy pushed King Saul to keep trying to assassinate his own son-in-law, that is David. Covetousness pushed David to steal his neighbor's wife and then kill the husband in the process as a cover-up. These two sins, envy and covetousness, are very destructive if put into action. Even lethal sins against your neighbor, but for different reasons. While envy is an evil and sinful thing of valuing your neighbor, in other words, we wish we were him. We wish he was out of the picture and I'm there living his life. While coveting is an evil and sinful action, of devaluing your neighbor. I wish I had his stuff more than I care for him. 
The unique evil of covetousness is that we value what our neighbor has more than what our neighbor is. We desire our neighbor's possessions for ourselves rather than loving our neighbor as ourselves, which makes coveting a particular heinous form of idolatry. Colossians 3 verse 5 says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, that is fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Sister White said the following in regards to the 10th commandment. The last commandment condemns covetousness. Every selfish desire, every degree of discontent, every act of overreaching, Every selfish gratification works to the strengthening and developing of a character which will destroy the Christ-likeness of the human agent and close the gates of the city of God against him. Now, covetousness, silence is the idolatry because it stems from a selfish desire that is born in a heart of ingratitude towards God's gifts and blessings bestowed upon yourself. It's never enough. Lord, give me more, and if you're not, I'm going to take what my neighbor has. That's why Sister White says that selfish gratification works to the strengthening and developing of a character which will destroy the Christ-likeness of the human agent. Coveting is a rejection of God as Creator and Lord over all since we treasure the stuff more than the, wine, than the one who provides all these things to us, and is also a rejection of God's image in our neighbor, because I am robbing him of the dignity that he deserves by having and living his own life. Coveting is a destructive sin. That's what Achan found out on his own skin. You see, when God gave the command and clear instruction to Joshua to tell all Israel that God was going to overthrow Jericho, and they were not supposed to take anything from Jericho for themselves, but all the gold, the silver, the vessels of bronze, and the vessels of iron were consecrated to the Lord. In other words, this is the first time they crossed over the river Jordan into the promised land, and All that booty, all that they were supposed to capture was the first fruits unto God. Everything belonged to God. This was the first fruits dedicated to Him. Now in Joshua chapter 7 tells us of a man driven by covetousness. Took of the accursed things and the things dedicated to the Lord. And because of that the entire camp had to suffer because of his sin. When Israel was defeated in the battle with the town of Ai, which is the next town they tried to overthrow after Jericho, and some of their soldiers died, Joshua came bewildered to talk with the Lord about this great defeat they have experienced. The Lord revealed to Joshua that one of the people of Israel had sinned, and they needed to find out who it was and punish the sin and administer justice. When Joshua and the elders cast lots under the guidance of the Lord, they found out the man who committed this great sin and brought death upon Israel. When confronted, Achan said the following. In Joshua 7 verse 21, he said, When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, he even had to say it was a beautiful thing, After he was caught, he's like, ah, this is a beautiful thing. I'm caught, but listen, it was beautiful. Even mentioning that, he tells us his heart was still there with the things he took. 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them and took them. And there they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. Achan's confession was not repentance, for he only confessed because he was caught, not because he was sorry. And that brought the ruin for him and for his whole family. It is the same with us and with the whole church family. 
If one person here living in open sin without repenting and without going to the Lord to find forgiveness, the whole church will suffer, for the church is one body. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 497, it says, Achan's sin brought disaster upon the whole nation. For one man's sin, the displeasure of God will rest upon his church till the transgression is searched out and put away. The influence most to be feared by the church is not that of open opposers, for that will come from the outside. The open opposers will be there. The infidels, the blasphemers, but of inconsistent professors of Christ. These are the ones that keep back the blessing of God, of the God of Israel, and bring weakness upon his people. When the church is in difficulty, when coldness and spiritual declension exist, giving occasion for the enemies of God to triumph, then instead of folding their hands and lamenting of their unhappy state, let its members inquire if there is not an Achan in the camp. With, humilia- with humiliation and searching of heart, let each seek to discover the hidden sins that shut out God's presence. Is anyone among us dealing with the sin of covetousness and not repenting? I invite you to come to the Lord and ask for forgiveness so that your sins may be blotted out, so that you may find salvation and peace for your soul. Covetousness is a serious sin, and it needs to be treated as such. Unfortunately, Gehazi didn't think much of it when he broke the 10th commandment. When Naaman found out through the Jewish servant girl that there is hope for his leprosy by going to the land of Israel to find prophet Elisha, he decided to go and bring rich gifts to the prophet of God in hopes for healing. Upon his arrival, Naaman inquired of Elisha the prophet and arrived to his house But God wanted to test Naaman's faith, so Elisha only sent a message to Naaman to go down to the river Jordan and deep dip himself seven times, also because the prophet would not come even to meet him in person. He stormed off toward Damascus. But on the way, his servants approached him and reasoned with him, that he should comply with this request, since the prophet didn't ask anything too hard for him to do. After agreeing with his servants, Naaman went to the river Jordan and did as instructed. And miraculously, the leprosy was healed. God had honored the faith of this Gentile person and made him whole again. Upon his return to Elisha's house, Naaman's gratefulness was overflowing and he wanted to shower the prophet with gifts. But Elisha refused because salvation and healing is not something that can be bought or sold, only received with gratitude and thanksgiving towards God. So Elisha sent him away in peace. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, coveted the gifts that Naaman had brought when he saw the gold, he saw the silver, he saw the clothes, like, wow. He did so much as he ran after Naaman and lied to him in order to get what he wanted. Naaman did not hesitate to give to the Gehazi according to his request and even went the extra mile to give him more than he asked. But because of his covetousness and lies, he paid dearly. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 25 to 27, Now upon his return back to the house, as now he went in and stood before the ma- his master, Elisha said to him, Where did you go, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant did not go anywhere. 
Then he said to him, Did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and to receive clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female servants? Therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence leprous, as white as snow. Was that the time for him to be asking for gifts from Naaman? Certainly not. Because if the gift was received, it would have been a stumbling block for an, in Naaman's understanding of salvation. He would have thought that it was the power of Elisha that healed him, and he had to be thankful and showered him with gifts. But Elisha's wise decision helped Naaman realize that it was God who made the miracle, <clears throat> and only him needs to be thanked and praised and worshipped. Gehazi's covetousness brought sickness and disaster upon his family, all because he loved the treasure of this earth more than he loved God from whom all treasures come from. That's what Jesus said to a man who was coveting for earthly possessions. In Luke 12, 30, 13 to 21, Jesus presents to us the parable of the rich fool. When one man from the crowd asked Jesus to tell his brother to divide the inheritance with him, the Savior, knowing this man's heart, said to him and to the entire crowd listening, and he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. This man knew the laws of the Old Testament, where the firstborn would receive a double portion of the inheritance, while the other brothers were to divide the rest of it. But this brother was driven by covetousness and was hoping for Jesus to solve his earthly business. When we covet, we love stuff more than the human life, more than the divine life, more than eternal life. Which is why Jesus told the man, the crowd, and to us that one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And when Jesus drove his point home by warning them through a, through a powerful parable. Then he continues saying in Luke 12, 16 to 21, Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. At a first glance, it looks like this parable has nothing to do with coveting. But let's look at it again. This man's covetousness turned into greed and stopped being concerned for his neighbor and only concerned for himself. Through coveting, the command from God to love your neighbor as yourself is broken because you only look after your own interests and needs and wants and you forget that God is abundantly blessing you so that you can bless others that are less fortunate than you. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says, For the love of money, not money in and of themselves, the love of money is the root, is the root of all kinds of evil. 
for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Many people are chasing and following money through their covetousness and forget to chase and follow Jesus instead. Riches are not a bad thing in and of themselves, but they can become bad if we lose focus of Jesus. Jesus said that we will always have the poor among us. And that was a promise. We always have the poor among us. And God is blessing us extra each and every year so that we may share from that abundance with those that are needy and crying to the Lord. The way sometimes God answers that man's prayer is through your generosity. You're not generous. God sometimes cannot answer that prayer through you and bypasses you to another person that might be generous. And you miss out on the blessing that God intended for you to give because of your generous acts. Jesus wants us to exercise our joy of giving to others and to be as a reminder that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Our Lord and Savior knew that freedom from all covetousness is possible only if we have a value for a superior treasure. You see, just as much as social media is a platform for sharing thoughts, ideas, pictures, and keeping in touch with family and friends, it is also a place where the most coveting is happening today. We covet other people's vacations. We covet other people's lifestyles. We covet other people's possessions that are displayed online. We covet other people's wives. And we close the social media. We put our phones, our tablets, computers away. And we start to think about our lives in comparison with what we saw online. And we start to feel empty and wishing we had what our neighbor has and we start to covet. And so... His message, Christ's message from this section of Luke 12, is to protect us from the snare that plunges so many into ruin and destruction by instructing us to pursue the real, true, superior, eternal treasure and to do that with all our hearts. For obedience is a matter of the heart. That's why Jesus said in Luke 12, 34, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So what should we do about it? Paul tells us what we need to do. Hebrews 13, verse 5, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You see, God's promise to us that he'll never leave us nor forsake us should be a reminder that we should not worry about anything regarding our earthly possessions. If I will always be with you, Christ says, I will provide for you. I know your needs. I know how many hairs you have on your head or how many you have left on your head. I know all about you. And if I know everything about you, I know what your needs are. Therefore, he says, be content with the things that you have. The antidote for covetousness is gratitude and thankfulness. Be content with what you have because Jesus promised to us that he will not leave us alone or forsake us. God will provide for you all things. When you covet something, you do not trust that God, as your Father, your Heavenly Father, can provide for your needs. Coveting is a lack of faith in God. But God is inviting us to practice gratitude and thankfulness instead by trusting in Him. This Thanksgiving weekend... God is inviting you to practice 
being grateful and thankful for what you have. For all that you are, all that you have become in Jesus, we need to come and say, thank you, Lord. Keeping the 10th commandment is a sign of a changed and transformed life that only Jesus through the Holy Spirit can provide for you. Thankfulness is a sign of a changed life. It is a mark of a mature Christian. Even in simple things, we need to be thankful and grateful to God. Don't deserve your praise to God only for the big things in life. Recognize that God is the giver of all good gifts in life, whether small or big. Have you thanked God for everything that you have, everything that you are, and everything that He has done for you? God is waiting for you to thank Him. Colossians 3, verse 15, it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you also are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Being thankful and grateful and content for what you have means that you will not crave nor covet what someone else has, but your attitudes, your words, your actions will show that what you are, what you have is a blessing from God, and you recognize that it is enough. Remember the words of Jesus from Luke 12, verse 15. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Sometimes we like the status that our possessions put us on. I am this rich, therefore I am important. If I am poor, I am not important. Remember, your identity is not in the things you have. Your identity of who you are is in Christ. Whether rich or poor, we're all the same at the foot of the cross. When you come to the grave, the rich and the poor go in the same place. And you take nothing with you. Riches are a blessing from God. But if misused, they will prove to be a curse. So I invite you. Do not lose your own soul in the process of acquiring an abundance of things and do not neglect the real important things in life, such as God and family. In conclusion, I'd like to read to you a poem by Roger Horsch that is entitled, Thank You, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for hearing me. When I get on my knees to pray, I thank you, Lord, every day for life as I go from day to day. I thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice when you died on the cross for me. I once walked through life being blinded, but because of you, I now can see. I thank you, Lord, for the miracles you send, your love, forgiveness, and grace I thank you, Lord, for carrying me when I could no longer set the pace. I thank you, Lord, for lifting me, my spirit you lift so high. I thank you, Lord, when I'm feeling down, because you give me the will to try. You give me the path, you gave me the path to eternal life. And only you, my Lord, know when the day I can thank you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. Be thankful, be grateful, and say to God, it is enough. Don't covet anymore. That's my prayer for you. Amen. Our closing song today is hymn number 590, Trust and Obey.
Let's stand and sing together. Let us bow our heads and pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful.